the distinguished president pro tempore of the United States Senate. I, I thank the uh, presiding officer for the recognition, and I thank uh, all who are here. <coughs> you know, excuse me. Um, There are some things we experience in life that we can never prepare for, no matter how hard we try. Embarking on a life with a person you love is one. Having, raising, and loving a child is another. And then there's this one today. I've been here 48 years. Perhaps to the dismay of hundreds of distinguished presiding officers, I've delivered many floor statements, some more eloquent than others, some less. But I've, <clears throat> I've never delivered a speech like this, and I so appreciate all of you indulging me. My friends and colleagues, Marcel and I have such warm and lasting memories of so many who have served in this chamber now and through many years, including mentors from the first day I arrived here, like Republican Senator Bob Stafford. He was our state's senior senator when I arrived here. And I watched him in awe, but he was the person who looked me in the eye and said to this 34-year-old freshman, Patrick, you're not my junior senator. From here on, you're my Senate partner. And what a difference that made. And in the last 48 years, the Senate has become a family to both Marcel and me. Here we found friends, some of our best friends, and relationships that will last throughout our lifetime. It's also the place where I had the privilege of fighting for Vermont, the place where I was born, where I met Marcel, the place where we, where we started our family, and the place to which early in the new year we will return together, to the state of our birth. But I have a reverence for this place and its history, its constitutional role, its people that I know we all share. I've had this sense of awe about the Senate from an early age. I used to walk to the Capitol in my time here as a law student at Georgetown University Law Center. I'd sit in the gallery. I'd watch transfixed as the Senate debated the most pressing issues of the day. Back then, I could have never imagined that I'd one day etch my name into one of these desks let alone that I'd have the opportunity to cast well over 17,000 votes, and that I would serve with 400 senators during my time here. Eight times the voters of Vermont, my neighbors, my friends, my family, gave me the great gift of their faith in sending me here to be their voice in the United States Senate. But what propelled me to run was a belief that I understood the needs and values of Vermont and thought it was time for a new generation to address them. Dublin-born parliamentarian Edmund Burke's speech to the electors of Bristol served as my North Star. He said, your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment. Burke also said that a representative ought not to sacrifice to you his conscience. After what many described that time as an improbable win in a state that had never elected a Democrat, never elected anybody as young as I was, I began my time in the Senate in the aftermath of a constitutional crisis. 
We faced a nation broken by the Watergate scandal, the resignation of President Nixon, and an endless war in Vietnam. And as I leave in a few days, the nation is coping with strains, strains and challenges of other kinds, including very real threats to the whole concept of a working democracy the sanctity of our Constitution, our elections, and the strength of the rule of law. And another thing I could never have imagined as that young law student sitting up there in the gallery was that one day this chamber itself and the Capitol would be stormed by a lawless and violent mob. Now the Senate can be <clears throat> the conscience of the nation. Being elected three times as president pro tem, I have felt I was entrusted as one of many stewards of the time-honored norms and traditions that are passed on over the years which helped build trust, which helped the Senate, when possible, to work through problems to get difficult things done, and to allow the Senate, at its best, to rise to the occasion and serve as the collective conscience of the nation. I've seen the importance of acts of grace and political self-restraint to make the Senate work. Now, when I write arrived here, bipartisan cooperation was the norm, not the exception. It was ingrained in the fabric of what it means to be a United States Senator. Now, make no mistake, the Senate of yesterday was far from perfect. <clears throat> I came here in 1975, and I realized several of you were not old enough to vote at that time. In that body, there were still senators who had signed the Southern Manifesto that filibustered landmark civil rights laws. It was a Senate of 99 people because there had been a tied race in New Hampshire. So I was, served, I was sworn in to serve alongside 98 other men, all men, not a single woman out of 100. And I thought, boy, progress was a long way away. But the Senate I entered had one remarkable redeeming quality. The overwhelming majority of senators of both parties believe they're here to do a job, not just score political points or reduce debate oratory to bumper sticker slogans. Issues like budgets and farm bills and transportation bills had nothing to do with whether a senator was a Republican or a Democrat. It was all about the nature of our home states. Now, no one would accuse Bob Dole or Ted Kennedy or George McGovern or Howard Baker or Paul Laxaw or so many others of being closet Democrats or closet Republicans. But each one of them understood that to do our jobs the right way, we had to work together, and we did. Republican leader Senator McConnell and I worked together on the Appropriations Committee. We passed our gavel back and forth on the Foreign Office Subcommittee, depending upon who was in the majority. And we worked together passing complex bills. But we worked with a sense of common purpose and respect and in incredible productivity because we had that common purpose. Now, of course, that did not mean there weren't times when both sides fought like cats and dogs on the Senate floor in an election campaign. That was understood. But there are unwritten rules that apply, quite different than they are today. Senators didn't engage in scorched earth politics because they knew they'd return the day after election to a Senate that only worked if you found 
and stood on common ground. The person you battle today might be someone you need to work with on a different issue tomorrow. Now, I'll share something easily forgotten, but something I learned on the Agriculture Committee. I once heard, overheard someone say in the cloakroom that they'd been out driving in, in the middle of nowhere. Well, I thought to myself, if you're one of the people who live there, you know it's always the middle of somewhere. And that was a bit of a brainstorm. For years, I've been traveling when Senate recesses allowed to try and understand the world a little better, travel to build some relationship with other leaders from other countries, allies and adversaries alike. And from that very first Codell onward, I found that almost without fail, when senators of both parties travel together, their partisan differences dull and their shared perspective grows. You see a country and you see each other, you see the country through each other's eyes, not just your own. So Dick Luger and I came up with a new idea. Let's have a Codell here at home in the United States to help senators understand their rural states, whether they're north, south, east, or west, had a lot in common, to make it clear that everywhere was somewhere. And nowhere was just a place on a map you hadn't experienced yet. So we explored those states together, having Codells in each of those states, Republican states and Democratic states, and hear from the people there. But more importantly, we got to know each other. We all became invested in each other's success, legislative and personal. I fear those days may be gone, but I pray just temporarily. Because if we don't start working together more, if we don't know and respect each other, the world's greatest deliberative body will sink slowly into irrelevance and heaven forbid become our own version of the House of Lords. Now, Mr. President, I'm especially proud of the work I've been able to do for Vermont and for Americans across the nation. Our distinguished leader here, Senator Schumer, has heard more about Vermont than anybody from New York ever has. And, thank, and I thank him, I thank him as a lifelong Vermonter for listening. And among them, the things we that came from Vermont, the Organic Standards and Labeling Act. First block because it'd be crunchy granola. Well, it's a $60 billion industry in this country now. Some crunch, some granola. <laughs> but we also enacted in this body the world's first ban on anti-personnel landmines. I started off having three votes back in me, three or four votes. When it came to a vote, every desk carrying a publication I helped write, the vote was 100 to zero across the political spectrum. I'm, I'm very, very proud of that. Decades of work here to protect our beloved Lake Champlain and supporting our farmers, forging new markets, revitalizing historic town centers across our state, greatly expand the Green Mountain National Forest by more than 140,000 acres that protect one of Vermont's, actually one of America's greatest treasures and bringing resources rebuilt after disasters from the devastation of Tropical Storm Irene to the ravage of COVID pandemic. And I can never thank enough the senators of both parties who joined with me on that. And the Leahy War Victims Fund, that's helped innocent victims of war across the globe. The Innocence Protection Act, the Kirk Bloodsworth Program to facilitate DNA evidence to convict the guilty and exonerate the innocents, and the human rights protections of the Leahy Law. I'll be ever grateful that I had an opportunity to be here to put
put those laws in place. And then we strengthened and extended the Violence Against Women Act. And I was joined in that by colleagues on both sides of the aisle so we could do it, making it the act it is today. Working on the Voting Rights Act and the Freedom of Information Act, where I joined with a prominent Republican and I as a Democrat saying Americans have a right to know what their government is doing no matter which party is in control of the government. A long time effort to restore <coughs> diplomatic relations with Cuba. And a landmark program to remediate toxic sites in Vietnam left over from the use of Agent Orange in Vietnam War and to care for those who are exposed. And I thank the presidents of both parties who backed me on doing that and brought relief to a country that so desperately needed it. And then we made our copyright laws more effective. The bill we're able to write updated the copyright laws for the first time in 50 years and in protecting Americans' privacy from government overreach I do think, and I've mentioned the strengthening of the Freedom of Information Act several times in several ways. We, no matter what party we belong to, we ought to know what our government is doing. I've often asked for the formula that I've used to get laws like these across the finish line. I must admit, I Allowed a little bit of humor this morning at 1 or 1.30 when he piled the omnibus bill. <laughs> I should probably release what I told Chairman Schumer. I do it very fairly. I treat every state the same <coughs> alphabetically, starting with the letter V. No, but let me be serious for a moment in case anybody thinks that's what we do. Uh, it, we do it because Democrats and Republicans learn to work together, and each side knows they don't get every single thing they want. But they can get most of the things the American people need. And it's far more important the American people are helped than any one of us individually. You know, it feels like yesterday I walked in my first meeting who, with a person who become my first majority leader. Iron Mike Mansfield. The majority leader put a fundamental question to every new senator. Why do you want to be here? For the title or to make a difference, to make lives better? And though he was a soft-spoken man who listened more than he spoke, rarely gave speeches on the Senate floor, Leader Mansfield dispensed one piece of advice it made as enduring an impression as the question he left to each senator to answer for, answer for themselves. He said, senators should always keep their word. And I think of that every single time I look at his portrait in the Mansfield room. And it struck me that across all those weighty debates, navigating the complicated and contradictory politics of the Senate, a caucus that included Everything, remember when I came in from social conservatives and segregationists to civil rights icons and prairie populists, Mansfield succeeded because he understood the currency of the institution was actually trust, not ideology. Senators should always keep their word. It's a simple formula, but it worked. If you knew what commitments colleagues had made to each other, you could count the votes. If you could count the votes, you could set the agenda. If you knew the agenda, you could set the schedule. If you could set the schedule, you could pass legislation and still send the senators home to be present in their states when it counted. And if 100 senators were invested in keeping the word to one another, then together we could keep our word to this institution and to the Constitution. So, Mr. President, I'm going to leave here with the satisfaction of knowing that I answered Leader Mansfield's question the best way I could, 
in keeping with my conscience. And I did what I could to make a difference. And I leave here knowing above all that right or wrong, difficult or easy, I kept my word to Vermont and to each of you. But I want to thank my current staff. My staff throughout those 48 years, they've steadfastly stood by me and our shared goals to deliver for Vermonters, for Vermont, and for all our country. <clears throat> and I want to thank my family, our children, their spouses, our grandchildren, my parents who were here with me to start this journey in my first Senate election, who I know watch over the entire Leahy family today, as do Marcel's parents, who are also there. What a gift. What a gift I have. I've had a mother and father who passed down to their children and grandchildren, not privilege, but a powerful example. <clears throat> when the problems of being half Irish and half Italian, sometimes your emotions can get on you. But of course, Marcel. I was 19. She was 17 when we met. I took one look at Marcel and I knew I wanted to go on every journey together. 63 years later, we're still on that journey. She is still my closest friend, my partner, and my anchor. And I've been uniquely blessed to serve with fellow Vermonters who share my deep love and commitment to Vermont. Senator Bob Stafford, Senator Jim Jeffords, Senator Bernie Sanders, Representative Peter Smith, and of course, Representative and now Senator-elect, Peter Welch. I couldn't be more grateful that Congressman and Senator-elect Peter Welch will be carrying on after me in his own agenda. I might mention, you're going to like and respect the new fellow Senator. I think people will on both sides of the aisle. Our collective efforts and why in so many ways Vermont continues to set an example for the nation to follow. But Marcel and I will leave with the same conviction that brought us to Washington in the first place, that the brighter horizons of tomorrow hold the hope of the future. I have still carrying that same sense of reverence about the place I felt as a law student. I've had and still had so many pinch me moments. And one of the last ones, will be etching my name inside my desk. And I'll forever carry with me the enduring bond of my fellow Vermonters, their common sense and goodness, what I try to represent as their representatives. What a place this is. I wrote those words in the margin of my legal pad as I wrote back to our house late one evening after a very full Senate session last year as we're working out COVID relief for people who are still hurting. But what a place this is still. And I wonder what this 82-year-old president pro tempore of the United States Senate would love to say to a 33-year-old version of myself nervously walking for the first time onto the Senate floor. A 82-year-old president pro tem would say to that 33-year-old brand new senator, from Vermont. Don't lose that sense of awe, kid. Hold on to it. Treasure it. Don't even for a minute forget what a privilege and responsibility it is to serve here. I've never forget, forgotten. Sometimes when I drive past the Jefferson Memorial, I look at Jefferson in the marble rotunda. I'm reminded of the tension that was and is America. Imperfect people struggling to make reality out of ideals. They fail themselves to me, but always, always keep on trying. I think about, 
I think of my father, the self-taught historian. He loved to share with me the twists and turns of times gone by, not to lift up heroes as idols or point out their feet of clay, but to find meaning and purpose in the journey. Only first-generation immigrants like my mother, whose parents had left homes where such journeys of change and redemption were not possible, could have such a gleeful appreciation for the fact that America wasn't a place but an idea, an idea of unmatched possibilities, ever in search of its own perfection, for new and next generations to write. I've so loved the privilege of being even a small part of this story, America's story. And I've loved the privilege of working with giants and heroes here in this chamber. I think of John Glenn and the Senate he represented. We came in together. But I wonder how you think of the, how we carried the baton he passed on to the next generation. And then my mind flashes back to John's internment at Arlington National Cemetery. In the chapel, we gathered. At the end, the Marine Bugler played taps. Imagine a somber feeling. He paused. And then completing a request that Senator Glenn had made himself, but kept as a surprise, burst into reverie. The mood in that chapel. Because that was John Glenn. There was a time to mourn and remember was lost. But there's always another mission, another call to serve, another day. And that's how it has to be for every one of us, every one of us in this chamber. Yes, the Senate's broken in too many places. No, our institutions are not what Mike Mansfield and Hugh Scott and Jerry Ford and Hubert Humphrey, Ted Kennedy, John Sennett, Barry Goldrock knew them to be. But some of that change is good. A lot of it is tragic. And all of it is simply what it is. And I tell my colleagues, you can point fingers, or you can point the way forward to something better. And that's America, isn't it? So I don't leave here today with a requiem for the Senate. I leave here with a recipe and request for its renewal. Not taps, but reveille. Always reaching, always repairing, never retreating, never retiring from the journey. America doesn't stop. The Senate just keeps turning. And if we're lucky, if we're lucky, all of us get a chance to help tilt the trajectory forward. Just remember what Mike Mansfield said, keep your word. 30 years ago, I visited a refugee camp after a war in that country. I brought my cameras, I do everywhere, so I could show people back in Washington the human toll of this issue. Always on visits like this, I'd ask if it's okay to take someone's picture. You know, to be a displaced person is to have endured enough without having somebody invade your privacy. On this trip, a man encouraged me to take his picture. I looked at his worn, his weary face to the rangefinder. We sat and talked afterward. He said simply, don't forget people like me. That black and white picture has hung above my desk for 30 years since. Every day I come to work, he's looking at me. He's saying, you don't know my name. You don't speak my language. There's nothing I can do to help you. But what are you doing to help people like me? Conscience. That's what people are hungry for governments to stand for. So now I'm taking my conscience photo home with me. But I know that man's eyes will keep watching all of us and all of you. What a journey. What an abiding hope that someday after I'm gone, the Senate and both parties will come back together to be the conscience of the nation. You can build a Senate defined not by sound bites, but one strength in women and men with a sense of history, insists our republic move forward. For the sake of all those children and their children and all children, all Americans, it not only can be done, it has to be done. 
Serving with 400 different senators has been an honor, but representing Vermonters has been the greatest honor. I'm humbled and always will be by their support. I'm confident in what the future holds. But that's going to be up to all of you. I'll submit a list of the staff that made it possible over the years for me to do this, the people who deserve the credit for my accomplishments. I end with to every one of my colleagues. 